Well, at um, one minute past four UK time, uh, we're going to start this uh, special meeting of the British Society of Gerontology Special Interest Group in Aging Business and Society. I'm Ian Philp, I uh, have the privilege of being the chair of the Special Interest Group. And um, I am here with um, many colleagues who have been in our fantastic leadership team that has developed our special interest group work over the last year. And we already have uh, more than 50 people joining us online. Welcome uh, to you all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're very pleased to contribute to the amazing program in uh, Longevity Week. And we hope to add significant value to thinking and to prepare for a year of activity where we will pursue our mission to bring together the communities of social gerontology, academics who study aging and older people, and the business community uh, for the benefit of improving older people's lives. Um, at the end of um, our first year of activity, and you'll hear more about this from Rob Walton, Deputy Chair, in a few minutes, uh, we agreed that we would uh, take a policy focus for our work in the year ahead. And we will, around that policy focus, develop a series of initiatives that we think will make a practical difference to uh, policy, practice, to business, and to science. And we chose retail. Um, and we chose retail um, because we feel it's an underserved area where business and uh, social gerontologists have got together um, to try and um, improve uh, the retail offer to older people. Um, and we feel that there, there is in this area a lot of work that we could do to add some value. Um, and we think, you know, at a time when we're certainly feeling the cost of living crisis, it would be good to look at uh, retail from the perspective of both business and the user, the older user, to see how we navigate our way through um, difficult times. Um, You'll hear more from experts on, on retail, uh, particularly uh, Elsa Forbes, who will be uh, one of our principal uh, contributors today, who has taken up uh, a lead role in the International Longevity Centre UK to focus on the retail area. Um, but you'll also hear from uh, many others bringing different perspectives uh, to this agenda. So, I will uh, leave you in a bit of suspense about what's going to follow, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And there will be time for questions and comment from, from everybody at, at, at various stages during the program this afternoon. Um, but at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Rob Walton, uh, who's going to summarize for everybody what we uh, think we've achieved in our first year as a special interest group in aging business and society. So Rob, can I hand over to you, please? Yes, thanks Ian, thanks for your excellent introduction. Um, as I, you say, my name is Rob Walton, I'm deputy chair of the SIG. I'm also a founder and managing director of Covostra, uh, uh, an organization focused on community development, strategy and advocacy. And I'm really looking forward today to be able to tell you about the journey that many of you took with us over the course of the uh, last year. Um, but I'm going to take us right back to the beginning, back to April of 2021. <laughs> he searched at his calendar very quickly, 2021, and um, a conversation that took place between about 40 folk uh, really to discuss a, hypo a hypothesis that there is a need to better build connectivity and engagement between social gerontology and the business community for the benefit of society. Uh, and it was agreed in that meeting that we should form a group like this. Uh, and so from that period, over the summer of 2021, we convened a leadership team uh, as a first step. And that leadership team, many of the people uh, on it, you will meet today uh, through presentations uh, and exchange. Um, 
but it represents the leading uh, organizations in social gerontology and aging uh, in the UK uh, and also uh, in some parts of Europe and the US. So we're very pleased at the, uh, the excellent reach that, that this organization has created in pursuit of a mission that, that this group decided upon uh, in its first uh, leadership team meeting, which was to facilitate engagement between the gerontology and business communities to help older people live independently and be able to do the things that give their lives meaning. Uh, and within that context, the SIG at that point had three main aims. The first was to foster the career development of social gerontology through collaboration with business. Uh, that might be around pursuing a career in business while retaining the connection with the gerontology community. The second was about supporting businesses to better understand older people in aging uh, and to help them uh, in the context of business development. And the third was really in support of the WHO Decade of Healthy Aging uh, and the UN SDGs around health and well-being uh, and the reduction of inequalities. So within that context, I have a few pieces of reportable activity that took place in 2021. Um, and uh, the first was that the group planned and delivered a launch event in November 2021 uh, that took place um, as today uh, with the kind support uh, of Longevity Week and the Longevity Forum. Um, there were a number of registrations uh, and attendees at that event that have followed us through our journey uh, and we conducted three workshops events during that time. And I'm going to just pop a slide up here to sort of set out who was in that room, who led those conversations and what the topics were. Um, and so we had uh, empowering social gerontology to work effectively with and in business. So uh, our key issue number one, uh, we had working together for the decade of healthy aging, that was number three, and then there at the bottom, and number two, how can gerontology and business work together uh, for mutual benefit? And I just wanna say that those were excellent conversations that took place uh, for our group, uh, and to thank uh, the, the many people that you can see that took part to, to lead really uh, illuminating conversations. Um, actually, throughout the series of events, the number of registrations and attendee, live chat participants, grew consecutively higher in terms of metrics for every meeting. Uh, for each event, the average number of delegates registered was 90. Uh, and in that time, the membership of the SIG grew to more than 250 members. Uh, as I mentioned, it was recognized as a partner of Longevity Week and we're delighted that once again this year, we've been part of those events uh, uh, and in the full spirit of partnership. Um, as part of our work with the SIG, we're granted £500 a year and we've devoted that £500 a year to delivering these events uh, and that we've been fortunate also and I'd like to say thank you to uh, Innovate UK uh, for their um, brilliant sponsorship of the uh, organisation over the last year. Um, so we took a journey and they were the reportable outcomes but we learned through that journey and I think the biggest thing we learned is that there is an opportunity uh, and a big opportunity here. And that opportunity is uh, that business and uh, academic gerontology may have come from different perspectives, but there is a potential to create great alignment and that potential is growing uh, as our pressures of our demographic change uh, are growing too. And actually with these efforts, we can accelerate that further. Um, while mindsets have to change, there still is a significant opportunity for business and gerontology to appreciate one another's strengths and to understand one another's challenges, um, and particularly with the view to understanding the end consumer's perspectives and needs, uh, and that there should be more help to support both parties, business and gerontology, to come together. And that's about establishing relationships where they don't exist, creating opportunities where they've never been, and in concluding capacity building that we maybe have only just begun to realize at this point about how important and urgent those tasks are. So we recommend honest conversations. Uh, it's the start and the finish of all of these transactions. Uh, and there are honest conversations that between, take place between these two communities for mutual benefit so that we can champion the needs of each other's uh, parties and the challenges of e that each other face in order to promote a healthy aging future where there is effective support for uh, older and aging people. So um, we think that many academic institutions are already creating these opportunities as 
are some players in the business sector. And a part of what we want to do is try to put a lasso around that and, and create it uh, in such a way that there is a social benefit um, accruing. And we think that ultimately, and if you could go to my next slide, um, that that falls into three key domains. And we'll talk about this, um, as Ian has alluded to uh, earlier, but we'll talk about it. It's about network, it's about reach, and it's an out about output. So we, we can develop a strong network, a strong multi-stakeholder community of practice. Uh, and that practice can be developed through the proliferation of a diverse membership who are exchanging actively with us and that transaction is two way. Um, we can grow our reach and our influence by developing potential as a community beacon. Uh, so that community of practice becoming a beacon point for advocacy and business uh, in an aging society. And third, um, we can deliver outputs uh, that make a practical difference to the community from this work. Uh, and that is all I had to say, thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for all the um, work and energy and intellect you've put into supporting the development of the group over the last year. Um, so um, in the, this uh, um, session this afternoon, we're, we're looking ahead to the year ahead, and we're looking to translate the um, high intentions we have as a special interest group for making a difference into some practical initiatives. And we're going to give you a flavor of the, if you like the smorgasbord of initiatives that we are launching. And we will be inviting everybody to take part in those that would be of interest to you. So in the year ahead, we're going to run three thematic workshops which will be designed to improve knowledge and understanding about um, improving the retail experience, improving product design, and the use of language and representation um, of older people in retail. And colleagues here, and I'll introduce them individually when it comes to, will be giving you a flavor of the, the high level thinking around these themes and we'll follow up with workshops to which everyone will be invited. Uh, we're also planning to develop an internship programme where gerontologists can uh, spend time as interns in businesses. Uh, there's a well-established method for doing these sort of internships. We'd like to create a, a series of internships for people working in the retail sector of geront gerontologists to work in the retail sector. And we'll hear more about our thinking about that and enlisting help and support from you in developing that programme. Um, we're also very keen, as you might imagine, to support knowledge transfer. How do we build on best knowledge and understanding and transfer that to the broader community of interest in uh, the retail space. And you'll hear um, about the work that we're planning, some very exciting work that we're planning in that area in the year ahead. Um, and um, we will have a debate this year as to whether this group should develop a charter for the retail sector to be an age-friendly sector. And that work will emerge from the work we do this year if we think there is a gap to fill there. Um, we know there are lots of charters around, but we'll only take that forward if we think we can add significant value. But we'll be discussing with you the potential for doing that. Um, and then, um, so you're going to hear about all of this uh, in the next hour or so. And I won't uh, spend any more time introducing what we're going to do. We're going to now just do it. And we're going to start with Ilsa Forbes. So I mentioned Ilsa's recently joined International Longevity Centre UK. And Ilsa is going to share with you her thoughts about improving the retail experience for older people. Ilsa. Thank you so much, Ian, for that, um, that very generous uh, introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be able to um, 
give you my kind of first thoughts about improving the retail experience for older people um, and just to uh, to put a little bit more um, information there uh, the International Longevity Centre is the UK's only specialist think tank um, which have been in existence for 25 years and we look at in the impact of longevity on society. And at the moment, I'm working on an 18 month uh, project, uh, collaborating and inspiring retailers around healthy aging. Uh, so to just clarify the, um, uh, the, the context, um, I'll be talking about the mainly the physical experience um, of, of retail and what that consists of. Um, rather than online, because um, this area needs very much due diligence and attention for another time. So perhaps that's a, that's a follow up, um, Ian. So the idea of the retail experience, what does that consist of? And my very quick conclusion is, in, is that it's so much more than just a poor quality, lifeless transaction, whatever your age, a retail experience is a cognitive activity, it's a physical activity, and it combines social engagement um, along with a journey of pleasure, satisfaction, frustration, or necessity. Um, for example, crucially within this realm, regular food shopping uh, provides older people with opportunities for social interaction as the risk of loneliness increases and staying in control of their own food shopping is considered by older people themselves as retaining their independence autonomy and having a sense of community belonging and as we age in later life we spend up to 80 percent of our time within the local community. So retail ties are uh, ever stronger. And there are obviously multiple uh, reasons for visiting shops. There's an ease of accessibility. Uh, many older people choose a supermarket according to the perception of uh, helpful staff um, and being able to offer a, a toilet or clean toilets and a cafe, a place to rest between sections of their journey. Um, and it's, it's also uh, an emergency solver, getting a key cut or a self-purchased treat, hairdressers, barbers, nails, uh, or for advice from uh, a pharmacy or a, or a hardware store. Um, and likewise, with the hospitality and leisure uh, industry, such as gyms, restaurants, cafes, cinemas, this is entertainment and keeping yourself healthy and keeping fit. Um, uh, for education, cultural pleasure, or catching up with friends and family. So it really is a myriad uh, interesting and uh, um, often vital, um, vital tasks. Um, my mum and dad used to use it as entertainment too, because we'd be taken with my two sisters to the local uh, pet shop uh, to look at the fish or, or the animals. And I think collectively we only ever got one hamster between the three of us uh, kids growing up. So, uh, so it is a multifaceted ecosystem. And um, the French uh, sociologist Pierre Bordeaux uh, looked, um, I, I'd like to apply that as a habitat. So it really is a multiple. Um, and within that, there are various forms of, of capital that um, the organizations, the bodies and the, the shoppers themselves and the, the workers hold, whether that's economic, cultural or social capital. Um, and this is, this is an enormous point that um, the cultural capital that older people hold um, as they have aged in place uh, and this place has changed and modernized and through their attachment to place, memories and associations, there's a vast social history and cultural bank. Um, so so that, that's another kind of ecosystem that is, that's, that's moving there. Um, we understand that improvements um, in one area for older people in the retail experience will propagate and permeate into uh, improvements all along the life course. So this is, a, you know, this is a, 
a, a project where everybody will um, genuinely uh, be uh, benefit. And to turn to um, the, the opportunities in uh, making this space uh, and improving this space for older people. Um, firstly, we do need a translation of the data and the research, which is already out there and translated into something that uh, retailers can um, understand large and small, whether it's a chain or an independent, and making a commercial proposition, because of course, you know, we are dealing with the retail sector um, and, and looking at um, uh, commerce is, is, is their first point. Um, we also need to recognize that the retail experience is a systemic relationship made up of multiple stakeholders from the minute that you leave the front door for that shopping experience to the to the moment that you arrive back so i think that's also important to to recognize that systemic um, framework and and how to improve this experience uh, for older people in in kind of five minutes or under well i feel that there are three there's a three-pronged uh, strategy, which is internally within the shops themselves, uh, and then externally, that external environment from door to door, and then attitudinally, because uh, there is an entrenched and ingrained environment which affects everything across these different sectors, from um, a buyer sitting in a head office choosing product to go into shops, um, to the way that we're advertised. Uh, so if I take those three points, um, the internal environment is, is split into two. So it's, it's one is very tangible, and that's um, e examples such as reaching stock or easy to reach signage, or making menus in restaurants a bigger font and easier to read. Uh, so, so there are um, some very quick and easy fixes and cheap fixes. And then there is an intangible um, element to this. This is presenting outstanding customer service uh, in a welcoming environment, addressing a customer's needs, and most importantly, respecting the individual, because there's such a, a huge demographic that come into at retail and it isn't one size fits all in terms of, of that approach. And then the external environment is, you know, almost the sky's the limit from regular bus timetables or irregular bus timetables to, um, to making that, that journey from door to door a pleasurable one, um, whether rubbish is collected regularly, whether uh, there is suitable street lighting um, at night, I mean, you know, it's getting dark now and uh, making that retail journey needs to be safe. Um, and then attitudinally, uh, which I think it really underpins all of this, uh, the, the way that we, we look and regard older people, um, whether that's in advertisements, um, and I appreciate this is much wider, um, or, or in, in the media, and that also goes for anything from the older section of greetings cards shops to mature clothing ranges. Um, this, this informs this, this ecosystem. Um, and this is all underpinned by also making sure that we keep in touch with our, our target customer, who is the, the older person, and ensuring that they are involved in the choices that uh, we make, the recommendations that 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 we put out there, um, uh, and a consultation. So I suppose the most important takeaway from this short talk is an acknowledgement that there are multiple stakeholders uh, within improving the retail experience for older people. And in order to affect change, I would put forward that these, these three areas need to be addressed by agencies in a collaborative nature as working in isolation is just going to be counterproductive. Uh, 
I have one very quick example, which is um, uh, in The Angel in uh, Islington in London, in North London, through, uh, through a, a business improvement district um, where businesses have a vested interest in making their high streets flourish. Uh, they have, all those businesses have access to a free assessment by a professional surveyor. So it means that they can get that valuable advice um, and have somebody uh, look at their shop and look at accessibility. Um, and that obviously will translate into um, a, a benefit across the life course as well. So this advice on improving accessibility um, uh, to their shop or indeed their hospitality premise um, is is extremely valuable and that's that's a, a that's a really interesting um, example there so in in summary um, creating a welcome safe energizing social and respectful retail experience for older people from the start to end will I hope counteract what I stated at the beginning of my talk, this should be so much more than just a poor quality, lifeless transaction. So look forward to working with um, uh, Ian and Rob Moore on, on this uh, vitally needed project. Um, Elsa, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lots of um, great thoughts and uh, stimulating ideas. I, I wasn't aware that Angel was particularly an, an aged uh, community in London. I thought it was full of rich millennials, but I, I guess there are some legacy older people who bought their houses there before they became exorbitant. And um, we need to create universal design, <laughs> shows my prejudices. Um, there are questions popping up in the chat and I'm making a note of one or two to pitch to the discussion we're gonna have at about quarter to five when we've heard from some other presentations but I think at this point we'll 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 move on keep your questions coming in the chat please thank you and um the the next um presentation there'll be there'll, there'll be two more and then we're going to have a break for panel discussion QA but the next brief presentation is going to be a double header from uh, Tim Shakespeare of Zinc and George McGuinness of Innovate UK uh, Tim and George, I'll hand over to you to talk about product design. Good. And I'm, um, I'm going to talk and I'm going to pick up, th this is probably a bit more moving on from, from Elsa's what to um, the beginnings of how. And to start with, lots of reports and talks about what the economic opportunity is, but the reality is proving really hard to crack. And I think I agree with advocates of design and more specifically inclusive design, that that is the key to unlocking this market. And Ailsa is sort of using what, what, what I think is, is a real retail buzzword, which is experience. And I think for many years, um, that, that idea of experience has led to ever more adventurous attempts to build temples to retail that converge shopping and amusement in its many forms. But what of our aging population? How does retail use design to create the sort of experiences Ailsa has talked about? Uh, it's of local access, places that meet their needs and products and services that they find attractive and easy to use. And actually it is all about inclusion, not an oldie special and rethinking place being local. So even if retail isn't your thing, I think these are themes that should chime. Uh, and help you have greater impact. Thanks for that introduction, George. I'm going to um, delve into those issues of design in a little bit more detail, starting off by talking about some of the problems that we see with um, product design currently, um, and then talk about some of the approaches that we can take, some of the principles that might kind of form behind that idea of inclusive design and might lead us to better design for older adults in the retail space. Um, and I wanted to start off by introducing George Lee, who's done some fantastic work around understanding what older people's experience is when it comes to the design of products. Um, so George, if I can introduce you and just ask you, um, first of all, can you tell us just kind of the name of your project and, and what made you um, interested to start it? Okay, so it's, um, hello everyone, absolutely delighted 
to be here. I mean, you know, what what a what a you know collaboration, brain power, brilliance, wonderful. So yeah, so I am um, um so I've been working with the Design Age Institute, part of the Royal College of Art, and more importantly, real older people, right? people like me, right? People who are over 50. Um, and so I've been working with the University of the Third Age and we did a project actually asking real people, um, weird, I know, what are the most frustrating projects in our daily life, in our homes, right? Okay, so it's called Designing the for the Everyday. Um, and so we we did a project um, and we we wanted to find out, you know, what are the most frustrating, irritating things in our house that causes us to feel that actually getting older is not a great thing. So we launched the um, a survey with the University of the Third Age, which have over, you know, half a million people around around the country. And within 24 hours, we had two and a half thousand people giving us their opinion and it was extraordinary so you know we had um you know a, a lot of, I'll just give you a few of them the top 10 so we had things like um tv remotes I mean who doesn't find tv remote and all those buttons really really irritating things like keys and locks sometimes they get they, they get stuck duvets who finds it's sort of like changing a duvet, a joyful, easy thing to do. No, so duvets were top of the, the things. Plugs, sometimes they get they get stuck. And um, too many gadgets and, and the kind of things on white goods. Who uses more than the sort of like, you know, 40 degrees and the 60 degrees on, on the washing machine? But anyway, all of these things were really, really frustrating. But the most powerful bit of information, and I think is absolutely extraordinary, 60% of all those people who, who within those 24 hours said the most frustrating thing, 60% were food packaging and medical packaging. Okay, right, okay. So who, who in this group finds it easy to open those, those like, you know, those pods of um, um, washing machines, no one, you know, and, and also people were talking about things like, like um, you know, you buy a new pack of scissors, but you have to get scissors to open the scissors, you know, it's, it's just like crazy. And, and so as well as all the frustration about getting into the packaging, and you know, it's, especially medical packaging. But, you know, some people were having to do 5, 10, 15, 20 bits of like, uh, you know, um, um, bits of medicine every day. They were finding having to come up with one guy said to me that he grew a his index finger nail long so he could open the the, the packaging because he could didn't have the strength to open them so actually so this packaging is really really frustrating now the interesting thing is as well as the frustration of trying to get into this packaging there was a real sense that actually this wastage the environmental impact of the packaging was huge so I think the reality is, I think we've got to start thinking that actually there's a sense that it's only young people who are really interested in sort of environmental issues. Absolutely not the case. So if we can find a way of making packaging really easy to get into and more sustainable, then actually you've got a great message, which actually resonates with older people and younger people and allows all of us to have the ease of use of getting into it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, for, um, summarized so brilliantly. And I think it really shows the insights you can get when you do ask people um, for their views. They will share them with you and you'll find out all sorts of things. But yeah. also what you said spoke to inclusivity, actually. The issues that you mentioned are issues that all of us will recognize, um, but perhaps are particularly difficult for people um, who are as they kind of as they age. Um, yeah. So I had one question that I wanted to give you a quick answer to which is what do you want people to do as a result of these Okay, so, so so designers have been trying lots of things for all, you know, for, for, for millennials. Actually, we what we need to do is we need to make um, some legal representation. So we have launched a petition, um, a government petition. We're trying to get 100,000 signatures. So it's talked about within the Houses of Parliament. So actually what we can make sure is that packaging is actually inclusive across all ages. So I think Tim, you're going to share the um, the, uh, the the link. The we've chat. only got eight. We've only got eighty signatures at the moment. It's just about to go out to the U three A. So I'm.
hoping we'll probably get 100,000 pretty quickly. But actually, if you can all sign up to it and share it to your networks, actually, we can make packaging easier for everyone to use. And once we've done it with packaging, we can start across every single bit of retail. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, George. That's um, fantastic. Um, and so I wanted just to finish off by saying a few things about what can kind of uh, what we can do behind that idea of inclusive design to really bring it out. And I think there are four kind of key elements I wanted to mention. So one is accessibility, one is empowerment, the third is scale, and then the fourth is co-design about the methods that we use. So when it comes to accessibility, that can mean designing things from scratch, um, making sure that all emerging technology and, ex and existing products are reviewed with an accessibility then. So who does this work for? Who can use it and who can't use it? Um, and so I think a great example of that kind of using existing technology comes from Amazon Alexa, who do brilliant work. They have a Alexa for everyone team whose job it is to work out how they um, make sure the technology they're developing works for everybody, even those who don't have tech familiarity. Another example is so the, the other uh, kind of principle was to be empowering and not stigmatizing. So this is the opportunity to tell a story that's about people's abilities, um, not what they can't do, um, which I think is really important as we design and as we, as we see marketing in the space. The third one was about scalability. And I think when it comes to retail, for us as the uh, this special interest group, really important for us to understand what the commercial needs are of the organizations that we're working with and how we can um, meet those needs at the same time as meeting the needs of older people, because I'm, I'm sure there are really strong um, relationships there to grow. Um, and then last but not least is the opportunity for co-design. So that's working with older people to bring fresh perspectives and better designs that meet people's needs. Um, and this week I was speaking with Sarah Campbell, who's one of the award winners in the Catalyst Awards, which is a, a program we run funded by UKRI and supporting researchers to develop new ideas. And she has a great example of how co-design completely changed the direction that she took her project by doing really in-depth work over a series of 11 focus groups. She um, initially wanted to get people together in, uh, in um, residential living, um, to help them connect to people, their kind of friends and family outside. What she learned through those groups is actually those people wanted connections with the other people in that setting. And she completely changed the way that she worked, but also by doing that deep co-design, she changed their experience of being in that place and gave them a really strong and empowering experience that showed them the difference that they could make um, by being part of this. And I think that kind of principle of co-design is something that comes across very strongly in a lot of academic and research work. And something that we can really bring an offer to other people who are working in this commercial space. So those are my four principles I wanted to share. George, do you have any final thoughts to wrap up on this section? Just very quickly, I mean, it's really interesting how this touches on other agendas. So um, I was just picking up from, from George Lee's thing, environment, you know, whether that's packaging, whether that's the amount of travel you, you take to go shopping and all the rest of it. There are parallels to that. I think the other one, George, that you, you picked out was inclusivity and particularly digital inclusion or exclusion in what we do. And you've just highlighted how it's not just about laptops and iPads, but it's about your TV, your microwave, your washing machine, all sorts of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. It's every aspect of our life. It really is. It really is. You're right. So, so, so some, some really really good sort of indication that this this is not just a narrow thing it, it, it speaks to a much broader agenda as well uh, thank you amazing triple header three for the price of two uh, George thank you for a very very stimulating presentation lots of thoughts bubbling around in the mind there I think the principal one for me is keep it simple stupid is as a, a, a fifth design principle um, so um, thank you for that. We will move on. Um, our next presentation is from also a double header, Tina Woods, uh, who wears so many different hats, Collider, all parliamentary party, all party parliamentary group, Business for Health, big mover and shaker in the world of aging, and Eric Kilstrom, equally big mover and shaker, um, leads the UK Aging 2.0 chapter. Um, so um, Tina and Eric are going to talk about language and representation of older people in this uh, sphere. Thanks, Tina, Eric. 
So <clears throat> I think Eric and I had a quick um, chat about this uh, a few days ago, and we thought um, I would start, he would um, come in, and we'll have a bit of a, a chat, a conversation. I know we've only got eight minutes, I think. So um, so I, I think many of you know, I, I've got a particular sort of science and sort of tech kind of interest, and um, uh, and and spent a lot of my time actually joining up um, sort of the world of science and tech and policy and government, business, investment community, et cetera, and trying to join, join the thinking, but also increasingly the language is really, really important. So I'm going to paint a picture sort of, you know, the language of aging or longevity, however we want to describe it, is so, so fundamental in terms of joining up the community. And so from science to shops, from cells to cities, I'm really interested actually in, in the underpinning science behind it. So I'll, talk, I'll touch upon, upon a little bit about that. Um, so uh, we, we obviously know that aging is malleable. There's a lot that we can do to influence our aging trajectory. Um, you know, we should be really, really optimistic about, you know, what the science and technology is telling us. But I think a lot of people don't really know about the potential of the science and technology. And I think, unfortunately, um, we have a mindset. And actually, the, the, a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past sort of three, four years now is really about sort of shifting that mindset from sort of like that negative view of aging to a much more positive view around the opportunities around living longer and longevity, et cetera. Um, and so I think, you know, disrupting those mindsets are, are, are so fundamental. And, and with that is the importance on the sort of the lexicon attached to that. So we know um, uh, we know that, uh, you know, right from the sort of the scientific bench to, to shops, you know, we do need to converge on a shared language. Um, and I think, uh, George, uh, you, you um, just touched upon this whole concept of the environment and in the choices that we make, how we feel about, you know, as we go about our daily life. Lives. These are really, really important and a concept that I've latched on to for a lot of the thinking and the work that I'm doing, for example, the National Innovation Center for Aging. And, and some of you will know I launched um, with them the Healthy Longevity Innovation Mission on Monday. It's all rooted in a scientific sort of framework around this concept called the exposome, which is really a, um, a sort of a scientific way of describing all the external factors in our environment that really influence our aging trajectory. So there's obviously a, a huge amount of research and funding that goes into the science and the biology of aging. But I think the really unexplored space, which I think is really fascinating and will really start to influence sort of, you know, consumer sort of, you know, retail and, and sort of, you know, marketing is, is the whole sort of the social sociology and the psychology of aging. So that's a really, really interesting space um, that it really is, is quite exciting. And, and most of you will know that, you know, there's, there's a certain, to a certain extent, our aging is influenced by our genetic inheritance, uh, but actually 75% or up to 80 or even 85% is, is very much to do with the wider determinants, you know, the environments, everything to do with, you know, our lifestyle, you know, the homes that we live in, you know, the green spaces, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, they're very, very influential in terms of, of speeding up or slowing down our, our rate of aging. Um, and so um, psychological age is, is uh, many scientists will sort of describe it in the context of, you know, your, chronolo your chronological stage in a healthy state without drags or mental illness or depression, you know, how you feel about your life, anxiety, etc. So this has been something that some of the really sort of pioneering um, scientists have been exploring, people like who I avidly follow, Alex, um, Alex Zavaronkov, who's doing a lot of AI sort of driven sort of work in, in aging clocks, etc. But he's doing a lot of work in psych psychological aging clocks. And together with people like Laura Carstensen in Stanford, who coined this um, uh, concept of called socio-emotional selectivity theory, how our outlook on life and how we feel about growing older actually really, really influences our mortality. And it actually really influences even our physiological responses. So I think that space is so interesting. And some research that was actually done ages ago at Harvard, um, uh, uh, the counterclockwise experiment, you know, how you feel as you go about will fundamentally influence your aging trajectory. They did an experiment with um, people sort of taking them back to the music that they used to listen to, you know, 30 years ago. So those who kind of hark back on their memories, they, 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 they actually measured their sort of, you know, their uh, physiological state afterwards. Those who kind of just thought about it, compared to those who actually physically lived it, listening to music, wearing the clothes that they used to wear, they actually had a, 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 a physiologically a slower rate of aging. So it just shows how your mindset is really, really fundamental to this. And I think, and I'll, I'll just spend one, uh, just very, very quickly, because I know my time is coming up. I think um, some of the work that I'm doing with NICA, some of really points to how our solutions really need to tackle that. So the psychological state of aging and why, for example, aging stereotypes and aging still remains fundamentally the biggest barrier that we have to crack. 
you know, from science, you know, to retail across the whole gamut of stakeholders. Um, and so, uh, so I think, um, uh, you know, this whole notion around hope, our, our reason for being, our sort of sense of optimism, how we feel about how people relate to us are so fundamental in terms of, you know, our aging trajectory. And so this kind of thinking, and now that we've got the science actually backing up, it really needs to translate into how we develop products and services, you know, right across the board, you know, in our environments and retail or housing, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and my final point, interestingly, re the retail sector is really what, because of the skill shortage crisis and because of all the, 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 the issues kind of post uh, pandemic, they're really looking to recruit more older workers into their workforce. They are desperately looking to create more flexible jobs. They need workers to help them out. So I think that might be the start of them actually changing how they see the older sort of retail customers. So hopefully that presents some opportunities moving forward, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Tina. Are you passing yeah. over to Eric? I'm yeah. passing over to Eric, who's going to yeah, take great. over. <laughs> I'm, right. Hopefully you can see my screen. I'm going to be quick. It's difficult to talk about representation without some pictures, so forgive me for doing some slides here. But um, essentially what I wanted to do was talk about um, the language and representation. Uh, we know uh, this audience is familiar with the fact that people, one in three people are experiencing ageism. Uh, Tina just talked about... Uh, the workforce, there are, House of Commons uh, report talked about 1 million people involuntarily uh, not involved in the workforce because of ageism. Culture hasn't caught up with science. Uh, and, and we were talking about uh, the, the high street. The ILC research shows that if we adapted the high street, we could add up to 4 billion pounds to the GDP economy. Uh, you know, we need to adapt it. But Part of it is the fact that we just don't have the, because culture hasn't caught up with the science, uh, a lot of it is around the language and the images that we use. Um, and, and, and I think retailers have a lot to answer for around all of this. And there was some research that was done by uh, uh, Hannah Swift, I believe, uh, was involved with it. And it was presented at the Center for Aging Better that basically talked about four different types of portrayals. Uh, one is uh, older people being portrayed as frail and vulnerable, uh, which reminds me of the red button, help, I've fallen, I can't get up. Uh, I'm sure people have heard uh, of that advert, but there are others, uh, you know, there are some who, who pre are presented wise and experienced. I don't know if anyone's seen the Dosaki's uh, uh, most interesting man in the world advert, but you know, uh, there are some ways of, of presenting older people uh, in a better light. Some of it gets a bit exaggerated. I can't tell you how many different pictures of older people on beach in white linen clothes uh, in sunny beaches. Uh, I, I don't know that many people who are retired in that way. I know there are a few, but um, not as many as you see on TV and, and radio, um, uh, print advert. But a lot of it gets to be unrealistic. Uh, uh, active and leisure oriented, but it gets to be exaggerated. I don't know if anyone's seen the Sun Life advert, uh, but I don't know anyone who zip lines off a cruise ship uh, into some sort of karate shop or, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's just not realistic. And, and to be honest with you, what do you expect from an industry that kicks people out when they get to 35? I, you know, I, I think the advertising industry has a lot to answer for when it comes to having empathy for the segment of the population that will be driving 50% of high street spend. You know, McKinsey talks about the over 50s driving in an urban environment, half of all urban consumption. And, and to treat them with stereotypes is, is wrong. Uh, is about the most polite word that I can find for it. So, you know, they're not the only organization uh, to, to have a look at this. Body Shop actually gets it. Um, they've got a really interesting, um, this is a headline from some recent media around what Body Shop has done. They have stopped using the word anti-aging in their advertising. Um, the, the beauty industry is... Um, not good for the mental well-being of their customers. Surveyed, they found that uh, it negatively impacts their self-esteem and mental health. Um, so, so the images that are used and the language that are used has a direct impact on their consumers, and and it has 
been wrong. Now, what's interesting is the pandemic changed everything, including our perception of gray and gray hair. So uh, Gray Evolution was a title of a Telegraph article last year that I, I like the title. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we ought to embrace uh, embrace this. And, and, and so during lockdown, women wore their gray as a badge of honor. There was a survey done by L'Oreal and, and they found that 47% of the women were embracing their gray hair and, and really wanted to do it to age fearlessly. Um, the Google searches and Pinterest searches were up by orders of magnitude for around gray highlights and, and uh, natural gray hair. So, so you could see people wanting this. Why does an industry catch up with all of that? And I think some of them are. There are role models that are being created. Uh, Tina talked about Laura Karstensen and, and Stanford. They have a new map of life. New, uh, and, and there's a big gaping hole called the active agers where you know people are living longer and they're active longer and they don't have any role models. Now, I, I, I like what Dame um, Helen Mirren is doing. And she, she says, look, when she was uh, awarded the, the she selected for the cover of not only People magazine, but Vogue magazine, she she basically didn't want to call it the beauty industry. She she says that the beauty industry gives people swagger. She wants to call it the swagger industry. And I like that word. I think that's an interesting way of looking at it and beginning to reinvent what we're looking at. And corporations have a responsibility here to work with agencies who understand their customers. And, and I applaud what Legal in General has done. They essentially have looked at retiring retirement cliches. So they, they fired their ad agency for an agency that basically says, um, how, how does it smash stereotypes? So their campaign is about smashing uh, objects, clocks, um, uh, rocking chairs, et cetera. So uh, I, I'm, I'll, I'll conclude on this quickly. Um, a lot of this just reminds me essentially of the movie Fried Green Tomatoes, where uh, Kathy Bates in the film was waiting very patiently to get into a parking spot and a young uh, two women uh, flew into the spot and turned to her and said, well, we're younger and faster. And as she started repeatedly bashing into her car, she says, I'm older and more insured. And there are these kinds of movie images that was done a long time ago. And I'm wondering why don't we see this more? It, it, it's happened, it's there. Why don't we see it more in the corporate advertising language and imagery? So I think there's a responsibility of corporations to have put onto their advertising agencies more empathy for their customers who will be driving high street spend. So I'll stop there um, and, and hand off to, to Ian, but um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thanks, Eric. Thanks, Tina. Um, so stimulating. There's a lot of chat going on. People loved lots of your ideas. And really, this is an advert for the workshop where we're going to be able to explore these ideas in depth. We can't do justice to them right now. But um, yeah, Tina, your your stuff with, uh, it reminds me of the work I did with Ellen Langer from Harvard. And we did a TV yes. program together, The Young Ones, where we gave celebrities a 70s existence and miraculously they exactly. improved in in every respect um but also when I, I looked at the blue zones where people live exceptionally long lives the seventh most important predictor of longevity in men was their self-esteem based on how they felt they looked in later life and I, know, I yeah tina yeah, just, I mean, I know we've got probably one minute left. I, so I find this so fascinating. And I, and I, so, so first of all, Eric mentioned this use of the word anti-aging. I totally agree. And scientists have to stop using that, that um, term curing aging. I hate all that language. It's just terrible. Reinforces ageism. But to your point, just very, very quickly, um, I, I, I think, um, uh, I had a very interesting uh, perspective shed, shed, you know, with plastic surgery and women who, and also men who get Botox and all this sort of facial sort of treatment. So one of the reasons why they do it is, be, is purely because they hate the reaction that they get from other people, th that they're old and that, that they're decrepit. So it's not vanity as such. They don't, they do it because of the reaction that they're getting from others. So I thought that's really, really interesting. And of course, if you also then suffer because of the way that you feel by being sort of seen as sort of haggard and tired and old, 
then of course you're going to be influenced completely how you feel about yourself. So I do think that's really, really interesting. And people like Caitlin Moran have spoken about that, someone who's quite sort of edgy and, you know, left wing and all the rest of it. And she's she's actually become quite keen on Botox because of that, that sort of reason, which I think is really, really interesting. And it just shows how you feel about yourself is so important to your confidence and the swagger, you know? So it is interesting. Yeah, great. Well, I've started the Q&A. Uh, <laughs> there are other uh, questions and these questions, people feel free to ask of, um, of Debbie, of George, of both Georges, of, of Tim and Eric. Um, and um, please, if anybody would like to jump in, please just do so. I mean, just while we're waiting before and people do interrupt me because uh, about this, but um, there, there was a question early on and I think this is for, um, sorry, 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 this is for Ailsa. Apologies, Ailsa. Um, um, this is for Ailsa. There was a question about, is there, how do you improve the retail experience for older people that live in spread out communities, older people that are, are isolated? And I think that was in response to some of your ideas about what should be a better experience for older people. Do you want to address that one, Ailsa? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I think that uh, in terms of unity, you have to you have to you have to start building that. And uh, um, online is a uh, is an area that that really does need to to be be addressed. Um, I. I wonder about um, retailers and giving them the 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 permission to be mobile um, and bringing bringing services to communities. There was a there was a great um, library service uh, that was in in really rural parts of of uh, Italy, and he the the guy had just converted a, a van. He pulled down the side. Um, and drove around that uh, that community, making sure that um, uh, kids uh, kids were able to to book out um, uh, books and publications. Um, and so, so I, th I think you need to think about retail, retail differently in terms of accessibility, whether that is online or whether that's um, being being mobile, and also retailers collaborating together. Um, to to reach uh, rural communities. All right, thanks, Ilsa. Dominique, actually, I'm glad your hand came up there. I was just going to pick out your comment about older people being suspicious of Alexa and Amazon. Uh, Dominique Lucas, please, um, I don't know if that was your question. Um, no, it wasn't my question, but I'm happy to, to, to comment on that anyway. I mean, I live in a, in a rural area currently. I am, um, I'm not 60 yet but I am old-fashioned anyway but I grow up with 90 year olds and 100 year olds and I find the whole longevity thing I'm catching up but I used to think well what's the big deal that we were always 90 and 100 in my family so um growing old isn't an issue for me so that's where I kind of come from um but one of the things that I find this is not about anyone in particular it's just about things I've been reading for the last year not what's being said here sort of patronizing and and upsetting in all of this is whether we're talking about the environment or whether we're talking about the retail all these things used to be there you know we, I live in a village with a shop um, and a doctor's surgery and a bus and we have a wonderful community and no one wants to leave here a lot of them are older um, because we have everything and we do have things that come here we have uh, people get together and do things life was a lot tougher when I lived in London for older people than it than it is here but we're constant, it's the same with, with, with the environmental thing. Um, they're always sort of going on about, oh, we need to be recycling, we need to this, we need to. We grew up with people recycling their, their, their bottles, you know, and, and saving their packaging. And if older people were included in these things from the beginning, these things aren't new. And it can sound quite patronizing to people who grew up with it anyway and who had it taken away to now being having it presented as something new. I think that's really the the comment I wanted to say, because a lot of these things were not new. They knew because we phased them out and now we're trying to get some of them back in. 
um, and intergenerational communication and working would have not needed us to reinvent all of these wheels. Obviously, there are lots of things that were wrong in the past as well. I'm not saying everything was rosy. So anyway, that was... And the comment about the Alexa was, I mean, most of the people I know around here, they don't actually want to be on Alexa. They don't want to be digitized. Um, their life is great until someone tells them that they can't go to their bank or they can't use something. Obviously, COVID was different if people were isolated. Um, you know, they want, I mean, I'm on Zoom because I'm at home and I couldn't go out and all of that. Um, but actually, there's a lot of hearts and minds to be one because I know a lot of people around here who wouldn't don't, just then just don't see what technology has to offer them um, unless with COVID, they couldn't do anything at all. So, um, and the presumption all the time is that these are good for you and, you know, and these you should have, but they don't actually want them. I'm not saying everybody, but there's quite a lot of people who don't, so. Dominic, thank you for that. I'll, I'll not bring others in now, George and Eric, sorry, just in the interest of time, but perhaps we can come back. We've got time later. Um, the um, really great, heartfelt perceptive comments as somebody who's observed older people and you're observing your own process going through that and observing your community it's back to tina's point i think about the social psychology that we need to study and learn lessons from about about the aging process and how that impacts on various aspects of our life um brilliant um let's let's just change gear now um we're going to move away from the sort of thematic areas that we were exploring that we will explore further in workshops in the year ahead and those of you who got excited by what you've heard if you got excited um, by anything you've heard just now I hope you'll sign up to participate in the specific workshops when you have a chance to uh, test the thinking with colleagues who have presented and contribute there. Um, we'll change gear into some of the initiatives that we're hoping to develop in the year ahead. One is around um, developing an internship program. And um, Paul Clarkson of the University of Manchester and Alison Benzema of the United St. Saviour's Charity are going to take us into that uh, discussion. I'll hand over to Paul and Alison. Thanks, Ian. Um, Eric, you had me laughing out loud with your imagery of older people. Um, and in fact, I'm going to keep going with that imagery and movies because I used to be part of the Emerging Researchers Committee and have now moved to be involved in the Business Committee. And I wish that this forum was more available to emerging researchers because it's such a fascinating conversation. Um, I had a conversation with the ERA members to kind of discuss what they would envisage this looking like, an internship. And I think it goes back to the language that we use and what our stereotype of an intern is. So what comes to mind is Robert De Niro in the movie, The Intern, because many people go into gerontology much later in life. So they might have a many feathers in their cap with experience from the corporate sector, from marketing, from finance, and have now through their lived experience gone into gerontology. Um, Another point that came up was ageism. Um, again, on our perception of what an intern looks like, is a business going to be bringing an intern who is in their late 50s, early 60s, even 70s? So how do we define what an intern looks like and what that role looks like? Um, and I think it goes down also then to value because if you're getting your PhD as a gerontologist, later on in life and you have this myriad of sk skill sets, um, how do we place value on that? And I know, Paul, that's something that we spoke about in our conversation earlier this week around resource and value. It is, Alison, thank you. Um, hi, folks, I'm Paul Clarks, and I'm an applied uh, academic researcher, uh, really, and uh, this is a, an opportunity for you to all to listen, eavesdrop, really, in a conversation that myself and Alison are having live now with um, uh, pre-planned a little bit of it but we're just going to go with the flow Alison aren't we and um, uh, yeah it, we've we're learning a lot from um, established partnerships between academia and in industry in aging mostly from the care sector is uh, myself and Alison's involvement but those can translate into principles for retail as well so we're going to pick up on a few of those in our conversation now uh, and one as Alison's rightly highlighted just now is uh, the resources and value uh, principles that we need to build into these um, internships. 
um, because um, there needs to be value both ways in terms of for the intern and for the host organization hosting the, the intern. That needs to be planned really carefully. There needs to be resource to both. Um, academic um, gerontologists, for example, tell us um, if they're going to provide um, um, support to businesses, for example, um, their PhD is, is not, not free. It's not for free. They, they can't provide their expertise for free. And likewise, businesses can't take things for free. They can't provide their organization as a host for free. So that, that organization, that planning needs to be done uh, really upfront. And um, uh, I'll put a few examples in the chat as we're talking just to, in a few minutes from some of the established partnerships between academia uh, and industry that are up and running now from major research funders, most, mostly in the care sector. So it needs to be planned properly, uh, Alison, doesn't it? And But there's a difference in perspectives between perhaps what the intern needs and wants and what the host organisation uh, needs and wants. And you've got a couple of things to say about that, haven't you? And I think that the, the difference in perspectives is a topic that came up in our first workshop last year between the languages that are spoken between academia and between business. So again, reflecting on the conversations I had with my, my era colleagues was uh, my one uh, era member said, well, I do social research, not market research. Mm -hmm. um, but as the conversation continued, and I think this is coming up in the conversation we're having today, mm -hmm. is that you can address social inequality and injustice through inclusive design, through affordability, through accessibility. And so it's finding that sweet spot between gerontologists and business so that maybe gerontologists don't feel like they're being exploited, that the motivations are being aligned. Um, I think the other area is with the zinc projects, and Tim, this has come up in conversation um, with the ERA members before, is that gerontologists don't necessarily want to be entrepreneurs. Um, and are there programs, and maybe this is where the internship or a work placement um, kind of format that we're looking at could provide that with an opportunity for gerontologists who want to dip their feet into business and have an opportunity to experience what it's like to work in a more corporate sector without necessarily having to take on the risk of being an entrepreneur. Um, so that provides a great opportunity for that. But I think it goes back to, you know, what do we mean by the space that we're working in. So I think Paul and I were trying to unpack, you know, what do we mean by the retail environment? And Alza, you did pick up on that today, but how can we relate the retail environment so broadly into opportunities for work experience? That's right, Alison. And we talked, didn't we, earlier this week, Alison, about um, some of the things that have already been raised in our discussion by presenters here today really great things actually about what 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 is retail what is the retail space what is the retail environment what does it look like it, it's a multitude of different elements i think and they, they've been discussed already uh, things like it includes service and product development um that's got to be inclusive of, of aging um it's the built environment that traditionally shops have been part of the built environment on the high street it could be an actual shop could be a pop-up pop up business. Uh, things are changing in the high street, aren't they? and that needs to be inclusive of, of older people. A lot of work going on in major cities at the moment, certainly in the UK, about um, reorientating the built environment around different needs of different people, uh, being it more a leisure space as well as a retail space, and the two combined. Um, we've heard a lot about the digital environment as well a lot of uh, modern businesses are, have gone digital particularly during the pandemic um, there's a lot of work academic work on uh, inclusivity of, of older people within uh, the digital environments digital applications digital retail that an, an, an internship could develop uh, um, the intern could um, inform businesses of, of the current thinking as regards including older people in the digital space a lot of work going on at the university of manchester certainly if people want to just look at that just put digital in the search function uh, obviously i'm bigging up my own university but there's a lot of universities um, the london universities for example um, york kent um, etc that are 
looking at this digital inclusivity. A lot of major research on that at the moment with local government as well. So these are all the things that uh, an internship could help to, to foster uh, knowledge for business about how to um, include older people uh, and knowledge for the intern as well about how they can work with business in, in creating, for example, evaluations of uh, you know research projects, etc. Um, there, there's a few examples I'll put in the chat just now, and then I'll introduce you back to Alice and just of some partnerships that have um, emerged between academia and business, mostly in the care sector with major uh, research funders at the moment, like um, NIHR, which is National Institute for Health and Care Research now, and UKRI. I'll put those in the chat for you just to have a look at while you're listening to the last bit of our conversation. And they they sort of form principles by which we could design our internships, I think, uh, about resources, about um, the breadth of the internship, what it covers, and what uh, specific academic knowledge businesses could um, um, benefit from. So I'll put those in the uh, partnership, but these are sort of virtual, I guess, partnerships. You, you have to apply for them and then they're sort of, they start and there's resources both ways. Um, but Alison's got some examples and more community examples, haven't you, Alison, on the ground, so to speak, um, about sort of partnerships. So over to you while I put things in the chat for people to have a look at. Thank you, Paul. Um, and I'm always pleased when Sarah Campbell's project is mentioned um, because I worked on that project. <laughs> and I think what the success of that project was, was the triage of trust between a community organization, which I worked for, the residents that I had established that trust and bringing Sarah in. So there's a good example of working multi-sectory in building that trust. Um, another area of an example is the Bermondsey Business Improvement District. They're wanting to become more inclusive. And the HUK in the area does a food delivery service. That funding is coming to an end. So what they wanting to do instead of deliver food is do a transport service to get all the people out of their houses to the shops. But they were saying that they are having resistance from the local retailers. So there is a classic example of a project that would benefit from bringing a gerontologist in to understand the, the complexity of the issue. Great. So Alison, Paul, thank you. Just in the interest of time, I think we will move it on um, and we'll pick up a bit in the Q&A. But what you've done is you've raised the importance, the potential importance of programmes, some of the principles, some of the benefits for both parties and some great examples. Um, there will be people um, on this call today who might be interested in helping with the design of a, of a programme that, that we as the special interest group would help to sponsor or support. So please, colleagues, if you are interested in getting involved in the design and development of internship programs, could you get in touch uh, with us or get in touch directly with Paul or Alison, if you don't mind, um, for help with this. There is one comment that I really did think was worth mentioning, um, in particular from Tim and George, that rather than calling interns, implying this is a sort of start for a business career, what about calling this a programme for scientists or gerontologists in residence? I really like that. Um, OK, so let's um, just move on now to um, Debbie Keeling, University of um, Sussex and Richard Whitfield from Emerald Publishing, who are going to talk to us about their cunning plan to support knowledge transfer from gerontology to the business community. I'll hand over to Debbie and Richard. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, I, I do love cunning plans, as you know. Um, Nam Namrita, do you have the slides? Or would you like me to share? Thanks. Um, so what, what, in terms of um, knowledge exchange, what we'd really like to do, if you can go to the next slide, please, is, um, is, is do a special issue, but um, it's not a special issue as you might know it. So we're not talking about special issues uh, about um, uh, publishing 
research articles, but rather impact articles. And what we mean by that is uh, an article type that focuses entirely on the impact that's been brought about through work and learning about that. So it, uh, to the left of the slide there, you can see that um, is about understanding where that, how that problem was identified, who the stakeholders were, how they were involved, the way in which co-creation uh, or, or, or other forms of collaboration were utilized, actually what impact was brought about over what sort of time period, um, what, in fact, how did the, the notions of impact change over that process? And, and, and also critically understanding the ethics of impact. And I think we don't mean ethics from a research point of view. We mean ethics from if you're bringing about a change, is this a change where you, that, that has been considered by stakeholders and the potential unintended consequences of impact have also been uh, considered? And um, you, it, it, the special issue really wants to uh, showcase work that um, uh, can demonstrate impact or impact uh, evidence impact very, uh, very much on the issues that you've heard today around goods and services that recognize difference uh, and not don't treat older consumers as one huge group. And we've had a comment about that in the chat. Um, that, that, that they also understand that uh, the uh, importance of space and that's not just space as one store but space as to how uh, um, uh, various stores uh, are brought together what, what else that space offers and also that space is a community and an environment and those wider issues that Elsa picked up on earlier and of course uh, about uh, we also heard about stigma and um, how do we market uh, uh, products, services, the way in which we portray people, the way in which we design and portray spaces that, that, that really tackle ageism. And uh, I put a few points there about the sort of things that we're, we're interested in, um, but you know, particularly around how the older consumer voice is, is uh, maybe not just included, but also driving design, um, how good services, spaces, um, can be much more effectively uh, produced and, and offered actually in collaboration with people. And particularly the, um, the special issue again, it is designed to capture non-academic authors' voices as well. So we're really encouraging teams of people to contribute to this where you have non-academic authors, but also that are interdisciplinary uh, and, and also um, bringing in, for example, investor views as well, and how investors are brought into that collaboration, and really very much about how we can um, uh, uh, reduce that, uh, the, the, those issues around ageism. Um, also important, and this is what I was mentioned before, about that fluidity of impact, and how impact is, uh, can be very much unexpected and how uh, it can come about through the process of working with various stakeholders and also that we have um, in, in undertaking work we have a, 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 a duty to understand how impact changes over time and for what time period and we also need to be much more responsive to the market and um, when I mentioned ethics before this is particularly important about how we understand the consequences of change in terms of avoiding bringing about more inequality. And sometimes when we address issues of inequality in one area, we can actually bring about issues of inequality in another area inadvertently, but because we haven't really considered those beforehand and we're not effectively taking those on board, um, it has those issues. And so the special issue is very much about learning through other people's experience of impact. Richard. Uh, thanks, Debbie. C could you move it on, Namri, so to the next slide? Thanks. So I, I'm Richard Whitfield. I'm from an academic publisher, and I work with Debbie, and I will work with Debbie on this project. And I'll just explain briefly why we as, a, as an academic publisher think this kind of project is so important. You know, I can see that quite a lot of people on the call today are not academics, and that is what this is all about. It's, you know, brilliant. Um, academic 
publishing of you know I've, in terms of full disclosure i've been working in publishing for 25 plus years <laughs> in terms of age and i've seen the the rise of sort of the impact factor which is all about how how well cited academic research is and then over the last few years people have started to realize that that is an impact in itself you know what is really important in terms of academic research is the societal impact that that research is having and em emerald as, a, as an academic publisher thinks that's really important we've signed up to something called dora which really says you know uh, impact needs to be looked at in its broadest sense the sustainable development goals are obviously very important they're important to this kind of project when you're talking about things like reducing inequality and you know as a publisher we've signed up to say that we will do everything we can to support those sustainable development goals. Uh, you know, we're trying to do lots of tangible things like, for example, impact services, explaining to, uh, to universities and, and academics and trying to support efforts for researchers to really understand impact, you know, how to design their research, how to figure out what sort of problem they're trying to address, how they'll know when they've achieved what they were aiming to achieve all that kind of thing and then we've we've worked already with debbie uh, on something i think namrita will be able to circulate um uh, an example of what we've already done with these kind of articles um which hopefully you would find interesting and lastly what i would say in terms of what debbie's explained here this is really quite a different way of looking at research because Traditionally, research is, a, is about the research. It's written at the time when the research is completed. And what we are talking about here is looking very much about at the impact of that research uh, at the time when the impact is achieved. It could be quite a long time after the research has been done. And there's a lot to be done here in terms of the way that that research is evaluated and everything. And that's the kind of thing that Debbie and I will be working on. Thanks, Richard. And I think just to say a plug that if you do feel that you have uh, a, a, some impact to share, where you could really uh, evidence and be best practice, also evidence learning about working with stakeholders uh, around understanding those different perspectives of ethics of impact, do get in touch with us. Fantastic. Thank you both for a great, succinct um, presentation. Um, we're going to have uh, five minutes of some Q&A and then Rob and I are going to wrap up the session for this evening. We've managed to hold on to nearly everybody from the start, which is very good. But I, I do have a one and a half hour rule, which suggests that after that time, people's attention and energy will drop. So you've, you're nearly there. Um, um, I'd, I'd actually like to bring um, Chris Britton in. Chris has put in some really interesting stuff in the chat about the work that Chris is doing in the States that we might want to... Hi, Chris. I didn't know if you were a man or a woman, but you've now... Uh, or how you identify, sorry. I'm in the new academic world. I'm an old guy. Um, the, um, the, the how, you know, anyway, after that embarrassing moment, I shall just pass over to you to talk about the work that you're doing, Chris, please. Brilliant, thank you. And, and apologies for flooding the comments. I'm so excited by what we do that I sometimes find it a little bit difficult to um, shut up. So uh, thank you for the opportunity for, um, for, for doing a, a bit of a talk rather than uh, keep flooding the comments. Um, so Get Set Up is a really, really interesting company. We started off teaching technology, uh virtually so it's all online everything we do is online we've got over 5 million active members every month who are all over 55 and we teach four and a half thousand live classes every single month um which is phenomenal it's it's three four five an hour um and the thing that makes us slightly different is that every single class is peer-to-peer -peer. so every single class is delivered by an older adult for an older adult and that increases the engagement, increases the relatability, the storytelling, all of the things that, um, you know, that, that our audience really care about. We are global. Uh, we operate in 160 countries or however many there are. Um, 
but predominantly we're in the US. So we, we are partnering with state and federal governments um, across the US. We partner with uh, corporates in the UK. We partner with uh, healthcare providers in India and, uh, and lots of other different types of organizations to, to ultimately provide this to older people for free. Um, and the classes vary. Uh, everything you can imagine from um, 750 people doing line dancing once a week uh, to um, you know, career advice and, and everything in between. So it really is kind of the whole spectrum um, of classes that people might be interested in. And I think that's probably enough time for me. Um, th thanks. That, that's great, Chris. And, and I think the insights that would come from the people, the older people that you work with and you help educate and you develop this peer learning, the insights from that are a wonderful resource. And, uh, you know, one of your comments was let's not stereotype uh, older people. Um, there's so many different subsets that we could look at. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for your contribution. Thanks, everybody, sure. for your contribution. Um, we, we are running out of time and I do want to let people get away on time. Um, what you've heard about is that the special interest group in the year ahead are going to run three thematic workshops on the retail experience for older people, improving it, the design for older people and language and representation. And please get involved in these. We've just scratched the surface of the issues in these areas. We're going to be developing uh, plans for an, um, a gerontologist in residence program for gerontologists to be placed within businesses to share insights. And we're, Debbie is leading uh, work with uh, Richard, the publisher, to produce a special issue on uh, impact, which we're going to focus around uh, older people. Um, and so please uh, do get involved contact Debbie and Richard if you want to get involved with that piece of work. If you've got great case studies in particular, I'm sure these would be most welcome. Um, please get involved and help with the development of the internship programme. Please get involved with the uh, workshops that we've got in the year ahead. At the end of the year, we might be able to produce a charter that distills all the learning and sets out in simple terms, what are the three or four or five things that all businesses should be thinking about with regard to older people, and particularly in the retail sector. But a lot of this uh, moves from specifically retail into broader questions about how gerontologists can work with industry. And we're, we're gonna use the lens of retail, if you like, to draw out the lessons and how we can make a difference in the year ahead. Um, uh, by joining this call, you are de facto members of our special interest group. It's uh, not a, an exclusive group. We don't charge membership fees, but we will keep in touch with you unless you tell us not to. And we hope that your knowledge and wisdom will help inform our work as we go forward. Um, that's my summary. I'll pass over actually to Rob. Uh, well, just Rob reversing our roles at the end. If you could just uh, say a few words just to finish off uh, the, this, uh, this event and um, anything uh, that, that you want to let people know about the practicalities of getting involved. Um, sure, in yeah. your head. Rob. I mean, all I want to say is congratulations on, to everybody. What a stunning, a stunning event. Um, I, I have never seen a chat so busy uh, as this one here. Uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers for the preparation you put into it. Um, I hope that through this process that this plan for the year ahead has come across really clearly, but I'm not going to make any apologies for just putting a bit more meat on the bones. And Namrita, I know in my predictable style, we put a, a boring slide together, but just to say our workshop events are going to be February, April and June as they're scheduled for this year. So we, we are really looking forward to seeing you um, again. Uh, our next event, which will be February, where we'll be looking at the uh, retail experience for older people. Um, we'll work the dates out. We'll let you know exactly the dates, but you can imagine that a lot of busy diaries at the moment. So we're really just trying to close in on a date for the first one. And secondly, uh, if you are looking to join these working groups, uh, Namrita will send out an expression of interest form after this event. And I think what we'll also include in there will be the details of uh, how to get involved in the impact article. Thanks so much, Debbie. Uh, we know that 
hot off the press, the landing page for what an impact article is uh, and how to build one um, is going to be in a link that we'll send through to the group um, over the next uh, day or so. And, uh, you know, finally, I think just to say thank you to George uh, for sharing. Was it George who shared the petition? But we'll also pick that up. Uh, really, you know, great cause, and we'll be happy to share that with the group as well. So, congratulations, absolutely superb event, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again here soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a pleasant morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are in the world. And we'll see you. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. bye.